I'm a, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I see, I hear stuff like that. And it's just a good time to be a part of the Impact Church world, eh? There's things happening, things happening all over the place. And those drawings, oh my goodness, that's really excited. Uh, and I, I love what Pastor Carl said about harvest. You know, there really is a harvest. And I, I don't know what you believe about where we are at in terms of God's timetable or anything like that. But, I mean, the Bible does say that there is a harvest coming. And, and you got to be ready for it. we got to anticipate it. Oh, my goodness. It's exciting times. But there's, a, there's people coming. And that means that we've got to be ready. we got to be ready with the message. we got to be ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a whole bunch of people. Because I'm telling you, they're coming. They're coming. So, as Pastor Carl said, we're going to continue on with the, the not sermon series today. And uh, do you know what I, I really like? I mean, we've had a couple, a couple of questions in, uh, in small groups and stuff about, like, why the thumbs down? Why the not? Well, you know what? We're actually looking at the knots from a, a very positive perspective. And uh, one, of the, one of the cool things about when you look at what something is not is it kind of brings clarity and precision to what is. So uh, even in the, the, uh, the pre-show today, we were talking about cars, what car you got your driver's license, license in. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if I were to tell you, you know what, this is the, the, the car that I did pass my test in, and I described it to you, I told you what the car was, and I got no frame of reference for that whatsoever. And I'm just like, what? What is that? Well, you can tell it to me. You can describe it to me till I'm blue in the face. I just don't have a reference for it. But maybe if you were to say something to me like, well, it's not like a Toyota. It's not a pickup truck. It's not a minivan. It's, it's not a, it does not have four wheel drive. Something, as soon as you start introducing what it's not, it just brings a little bit of clarity. And that's what we want to do by eliminating what things are not. And that's actually really, really important because there's a lot of really positive uh, verses in the Bible. There's a lot of really positive things that we hold on to. And uh, one of the things that we got to do is, is our lives need to be congru congruent with the whole message. So sometimes it's, it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, this is awesome. I, I love this Bible verse, or I love what this means. But then it's in the working out, the implications of what that is in the rest of our lives. That, that's kind of what discipleship's all about. That's kind of what the renewal of our mind is all about. And that's how kind of what they call negative theology can be very helpful. So for example, we know that God is love. So we know that he is not the opposite of love. So it, it can be very helpful exercise. So we're going to use that today. We're going to use this, this method of, of, of investigation and this method of revelation, actually, when we look at the Bible. And we're going to explore a little bit about what the gospel is by looking at what it's not. But like Pastor Carl said last week, we started with the fire must not go out. And just as a little bit of a recap, and this is super important, guys, the fire of God in the Old Testament, it came down from above. It started in heaven. God gave the Israelites incredible details and plans as to, to how to set up the law, how to set up the tabernacle, how to live their daily lives, how to order their community. But then the fire, he didn't give them any instructions for how to start a fire. He was incredibly detailed in so many aspects, but he said, you know what, I'm going to supply the fire. And the fire came from above, and it came down. And their sole job was just to tend that fire, just to keep it going, keep it burning. So in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we hear Paul saying things like, do not quench the Spirit. Here's the New Testament equivalent. The fire of God came at Pentecost. We were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came. And now our job is don't throw a wet blanket on that. Like, don't, uh, don't start things in the Spirit and then think just buying to the subtle delusion that you can then become perfect and finish what God started in our lives by the Spirit of God. When we embrace that subtlety, when we embrace that little bit of a, a lie, then we, we really do quench the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like saying to him, hey, thanks for the start, Holy Spirit. You just kind of take a, take a seat over there. I'll, 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 I got it from here. And that's a really good way to quench the Holy Spirit. So we don't want to do that. And it's really, really important. Watch this. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When the fire fell, when the fire falls, when the Holy Spirit came down, it says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the power came, the fire fell. But you know what? Amongst other things, the purpose of the fire falling and the purpose of the power that we've been given was that we would be his witnesses. That we would take what we knew of him. We would take this power in the, in the demonstration of the spirit and power with manifestations of fire. I mean, that's what fire does. It, it gives off heat. It gives off light. It does something to you. You can't encounter a fire and stay the same. So we've got the fire of God, but we've been given it so that we can carry it into the world and spread this fire that came from the altar. We're going to spread this fire, and with it, we've been given a message to share. And that's the message we kind of want to hone into a little bit today. And my hope is that as we regain some clarity clarity as to what the gospel is. That, you know, see, there's a prophetic authority. There's a, there's a real unction. There's a real power in the gospel when you share it. When you announce the good news, something amazing happens. 
Here's another not verse for you. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. See, it's the gospel that's the power of God for salvation. If, if we have a, a paradigm for change, or we're hoping for massive transformation in the world, or, or even for a harvest to come, and somehow it's not intricately connected to the proclamation of the gospel, I think we might be a little bit disappointed. And the, what we learned last week just kind of illustrates that. You see, the fire that fell, it fell on the altar. And everything that the priests did with fire from there on, they were supposed to take fire off of the altar and not take it, not get it from anywhere else, not start their own little fires. And I'll tell you, the good news of Jesus Christ and his finished work, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that is where the fire is. See, it's the altar of the cross that the fire is the source of all the fire in our lives. So you can see in the Bible these, these pairs everywhere. Fire and altar go together. Blood and spirit go together. You are not going to have the fire of God without a real understanding that it's actually sourced in the finished work of the cross. And that is what qualifies us, enables us, and makes it possible for us to experience this fire and share it. Because the fire and the altar are intricately together. So we got a message to share. We've got a gospel. We've got this, the power of God for salvation. So, I mean, we've got to know the gospel. We've got to be comfortable with it. We've got to be willing to share it. And we've got to be able to proclaim the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have been made Christ's ambassadors. See, we are his representatives. The word is not getting out there in any other way. Have you ever considered that God could send uh, 100,000 angels if he wanted and they could go preach the gospel? But he doesn't. Their ministering spirit sent to those who are the heirs of salvation. He's tasked us, you and me, the church, with the ability and the task and the responsibility of communicating this gospel. So we got to take up the challenge and we got to understand the message. And here is what I believe the core of the gospel message. And this is the first of our not scriptures that we're going to look at today. And uh, we're going to look at some Bible as well today. So I don't know if you want to get your Bible, pull it out, but we're going to do a little Bible study here. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. In Christ. I mean, that's an amazing statement right there. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And in Christ, it was at the cross. Not, not counting people's sins against them. Isn't that amazing? And just imagine unpacking the full implications of what that is. God is not holding people's sins against them. We're going to unpack that a little bit today, but we're also going to look at John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So there's our not verses for today. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, not holding their sins against them, and God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And I want to suggest to you that in light of the power of these two nots, in light of the implications of what these things mean. I mean, if we use these as our starting point and we work backwards and we use not to eliminate uh, all the other stuff that is uh, confusing and incongruent with the message, we're going to come to a pretty clear picture about what the gospel is. And to start this off, I wanna, I've, I've named this sermon called Not Guilty. And I'll tell you right now, this might sound a little bit scandalous, but I want to tell you, we're going to work backwards here today, but right off for the get-go, I do not believe God considers the, the world guilty of their sins. I honestly do that. I know that sounds massive. I know that sounds a little bit scandalous. We're going to look into the Bible and unpack what that means. But the, the verdict from heaven is not guilty. It's not guilty. And so I want to start by just kind of posing a question to you. I want to ask you something. What if, what if we consider, when we consider this gospel, what if we consider the good news that we have to share with the world? I mean, the means by which this harvest is going to come in. What if, what if the underlying assumption that we share this gospel with, that there's distance between God and the unbeliever, and that the problem of sin still needs to be overcome? What if those underlying assumptions, what if, what if those are not biblical ideas? What if those are not Christian ideas? I mean, that would, that would change our approach to sharing the gospel, wouldn't it? I mean, that would share our, our impression of who God is. What if these are uh, just kind of, I'm going to be honest, what if these are unbiblical assumptions that we've just kind of came to a conclusion about but haven't really dug into and looked at? So again, like I said, I'm just going to invite you on this journey, a little Bible study with me today, and we're going to unpack these things. But what I want to propose is this. What if the good news that we had to share with the world, what if it was just this? That God was in Christ reconciling you to himself, and he is not counting your sins against you. Could you imagine? What if if our message was, you are forgiven. 
You are not guilty. God has reconciled you to himself, and he is not holding your sins against you. I mean, that's amazing. And from there, I mean, we can explain what that means. We can unpack it. We can say, hey, the mechanism by which this is true is the fact that God became a man, took your sins, died on a cross, was raised from the dead three days later. And all of a sudden, instead of trying to feel the pressure of converting people, we're making disciples by explaining to them how this is so rather than trying to help people understand an equation to get them in the door. I mean, it's scandalous, and I know it sounds a little bit tough to just, I mean, in my mind anyways, for the longest time, I had this paradigm that it's us against the world. The church are the insiders, the world is the outsiders, and somehow what Jesus did, he did for us, not for them, but hey, it can be for them, as long as we use the gospel right and we can get people to walk over the bridge of the chasm between God and us and eliminate the distance by something that we do. And I think it's just because we've grown up for so long, or the, the message of the church for the last couple hundred years anyways, has been that God is holy, and he is, but that somehow he can't look upon sin, that our sin is separating us from God. And as a result, our message hasn't been God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. It's you can be forgiven. You will be forgiven, but only after you repent, confess, believe, behave, conform, com commit, decide, choose, accept, receive, whatever verb you want to throw in there. We offer, it's like we offer these things to God and as a token gesture and in response, then he forgives us. And I want to suggest to you that I really don't think that's the gospel. And I really think that when we do it that way, I think we're setting people up to start, not only uh, to finish what the Spirit began in their own flesh, but to start in the flesh, as if my, my Christianity hinges on the strength and the power of my commitment, or the strength and the power of my dedication, or the strength and the power of my, my willpower to choose him on a daily basis. And I've got to tell you, I just don't think that's the gospel. And I want to show you why. John chapter 1, verse 29, here is, I think, one of the earliest proclamations of the good news in the gospel. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Wow. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And by world, that's an absolutely amazing word. That doesn't just mean the believers in the world, and it doesn't just mean the unbelievers. It doesn't just mean the inhabitants of the earth. That word world is the word cosmos, and it means all the people in it, but it also means the whole structure and ordered system of the world. It actually means that Jesus, the Lamb of God, has taken away the sins of all the people, but he's also taken away the sins embedded in the structure of the world, the sin in nature, the sin in the structural and systemic sins that are embedded in our institutions in our cultures, the sin that permeates the worldview and collective natural and uh, national consciousness of, of people, the sin anywhere you find it, he has taken it away and he has removed it. And that's the good news that we have to share. And that's why God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Because the sins of the whole world have been removed from us. And what is the mechanism by which that happened? It's right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what, I mean, what happened to our sin? What happened to the sins of our ancestors? What happened to the sins that, you know, maybe our kids will commit in the future? What happened to the sins that are embedded in the structures and institutions of this world? What happened? Well, they were all placed in Jesus. They were all placed upon him at the cross and they were dealt with. All the sin in the whole world, all of it, all literally means all. All the sin of all time in every place, every space, and every person was localized into the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. And there he dealt a death blow to sin once and for all, for all time, for all eternity, for all people, and for the very world itself. Jesus came and he dealt with our problem. He really did. He, he came and he completely eradicated it. He did not come to tell the world how bad it was. He didn't come to tell the world how far it had drifted away, how awful it was, how perverted it was, defiled or deviant it was. That's actually what the law did. See, Paul, he called the law the ministry of death. He said the law was the ministry of condemnation. Because that's what the law did. It condemned you. It pointed out to you what was wrong, and then it produced death in you. Jesus didn't come to do that. He came in a totally different spirit. The law condemned, but God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. 
See, no, it's the switch that we've made from the old covenant to the new covenant is not just the method that, or the message that changed, but it's the method. It's not only that we've got a different message, but how God wants to bring change in people's lives is entirely different as well. The law tried to beat you over the head and cause you to see how bad you were so that you might get a revelation and say, okay, I need Jesus. How God brings transformation in people's lives, how he brings a change of mind as he demonstrates and reveals his goodness. And it says in Romans 2, I think it's chapter, or chapter 2, verse 4, I believe, where he says, don't you know, don't you despise the kindness and the riches and the forbearance and the patience of God? Don't you know that it's the goodness of God that leads you to salvation or to lead you to repentance? So the method changed as well. Jesus isn't running around trying to make everybody feel bad. He's trying to run around and through us revealing how good he is. And if you want an example of how this works, look at Luke chapter 5. You'll see Peter. He's on a fishing boat and uh, Jesus tells him, you know what, go, go cast out your nets again. And he's like, yeah, all right, I guess I'll, I'll believe you. We'll go do it. And he does. He goes out, he casts out his net, and he ends up with a massive haul of fish. And you know what uh, Peter's response was? It was, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Somehow Peter came into a revelation of his need for mercy and his need for Jesus. Not by Jesus standing there and saying, Peter, I know what you did last week and I know you're a naughty boy. No, he blessed him. He did good things for him. He revealed his goodness. He revealed his glory. And that's what moved Peter to have a revelation of, oh my goodness, I need this guy. Who is he? Who is he? And it was the goodness of God that changed his mind. And you see Peter following Jesus from then on. So Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came full of grace and truth. He, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now here's the deal. This is the big picture. This is something I want to, I, I just pray that you, you see it and, it and it just stretches your mind. It stretches the picture of God you have. It stretches the, the, the way that you see the world. It stretches your lens for viewing life. It stretches your lens for how you see the power of the cross. Here's a couple of verses I want to share with you. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. It says, and he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins also, or ours, our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that amazing? What Jesus did, he took, he was the mercy seat. He expiated our sins. He took away the sins of not just you and me, not just the people we know and go to church with, but the sins of the whole world. 1 Timothy 4.10, Paul talks about trusting in the living God, who is the Savior of all men especially those who believe. Isn't that amazing? What Jesus did, he did for us all, and he did to us all, and that is the good news. The good news is God loves you. The good news is God accepts you. The good news is that God has forgiven you, that in Christ he has reconciled you to himself. Past tense, it's done. What God has done, he did already, and he did it in Christ. He's not going to forgive your sins in the future. He's not going to forgive the sins of the world in the future. He did it already at the cross. And now he gives the forgiveness of sins. So here's the thing. In the spirit of not, I'd like to clarify a few things and hopefully do, again, do a little bit of a Bible study here. But in the spirit of not, here's what I'm not saying. Because I think that's really important to understand. I'm not saying that faith, confession, repentance, or anything like that is not important. And unfortunately, I'm not also saying, I'm not saying that I think everybody saves. I, I, that's unfortunate, but I don't think I can go that far either. But here's what I am saying, and here by clarifying it a little bit, I hope you understand, and I hope this will help you to uh, share the gospel with incredible confidence. You are not saved by your decision or your commitment. John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, it says, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of God, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So people are born of God, sorry, not of the will of man. It's not your decision for Jesus and your decision to make a commitment and then the power and the strength of that commitment that, that you know, fuels your relationship with Jesus. You're born of God because God made you born of him. It's not because of your decision or your commitment. And so the good news about that is I'm not trying to make people, when I share the gospel, I don't have to feel the pressure and the agitation of, oh my goodness, I've got to try and share this in a way that's going to work up a commitment in anybody else. I'm not asking people to make a decision. I'm asking people to realize that God has already made a decision for them. I'm not asking you to live by the strength of your commitment to him. I'm asking you to realize that he's committed to you. And the good work that he began in you, he is going to bring it through to completion. I want you to see this today too. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, you're not saved by your own ability to pump up faith. None of us have enough faith to get saved, if I'm being honest with you. I mean, I think that was the whole point of the parable when it, uh, Jesus said, you know, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, 
I don't think he was challenging them to work up faith. I think he was trying to say, hey guys, just, just as your fallen humanity is bankrupt in your ability to be moral and righteous on your own, you're also bankrupt in the faith department. You just don't have any. And he's got a solution for you. We're actually saved by the faith of Christ, not our own faith. And you know what? The Bible says that faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. And our job when we're communicating this beautiful gospel to a world out there is just to communicate it in its strength and its clarity and in its power and let the word bring its faith. We're not trying to pump people up into faith. We're not taking on the responsibility of micromanaging people's faith. We're announcing the good news. You are forgiven. And in the proclamation of that good news, there is faith that rises up. Now it's up to that individual to say yay or nay. It's up to that individual to embrace the faith that rises up and says, yes, I agree with that, or to squash it and say, no thanks, I prefer my darkness. But I'll tell you what, when you proclaim the word of God, the rhema word of God brings faith, and it liberates us from the need to try to pump it up ourselves. Here's another one. We are not saved by our ability to repent. I don't know if you know this, Acts chapter 5, verse 31, it says, Him, Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is actually something that happens after you've heard the gospel. It literally means, in light of this, have a change of mind. It, it means after thought. After this has come to your attention, what are you going to do? Now, the reality is the gospel, it comes to you. The presentation of Jesus Christ comes into our lives. And this isn't just true for when you get saved. I mean, this is true for all of life. This is true for the discipleship process of having my mind renewed. Revelation comes. A word of God comes. And my mind gets changed by that revelation. When new information is brought into my mind, then I get the, ch I get the opportunity to do I think differently or not. But I've already started. I've already engaged the process of thinking differently just by the fact that that revelation came to me. So repentance is a gift that Jesus gives to us. Yes. Think differently. That's a gift that he gives. And actually, if we want to get technical here, and we're going to get into this, but Acts chapter 5, verse 31, that uh, forgiveness of sins is actually a noun. It's not a verb. Yeah. So what that actually means is that Jesus gives repentance, and Jesus gives the forgiveness of sins. He's not up in heaven actively forgiving every single sin that we confess, or every single sin that we commit. There is a one-time forgiveness. There was a blanket forgiveness that Jesus did, uh, that God did, when Jesus took all of our sins on the cross. So God's not in heaven performing the action of forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. He gives the forgiveness of sins. And then finally, you got to know you're not saved because of your ability to confess. That's not how people get saved. We, we got to move away from the paradigm that says, I got to get people to confess their sins in order to get saved. No, do you know what we got to get people to do? We got to get people to confess and agree with the fact that Jesus is Lord. We got to get people to accept and, and, and agree with the fact that he died for our sins, that he was raised from the dead, that God is not holding our sins against us. See, confession and, and faith, it's really, really important. It's absolutely imperative. But, but just what is it? I mean, I think confession, it, it's just the heart speaking out loud with the lips that you agree with God that he has saved you. Confession is actually the antithesis of salvation, or, or the antithesis of works. Confession agrees with God. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you'll see on, on here, I've got the Greek word for, for confess. It's actually homo legeo. And it literally means to become in full agreement, to voice the same conclusion, to agree. So basically, when I confess my sins, what I'm doing is I'm saying the same thing. I'm voicing the same conclusion about my sin that God is. And what does God say about my sin? He says it's forgiven. He says it's gone. He says I'm not holding that against you anymore. It's gone. So we're not saved by our ability to recite and confess all of our sins. That, that puts into people a sin consciousness. And if that is your paradigm for your relationship with Jesus, I, I'd encourage you today to, to think differently, to repent of what you believe confession is all about. Because confession is agreeing with God. It's agreeing with God. I confess I'm healed by his stripes. I confess that my sins are forgiven and removed from me as far as the east is from the west. I confess that he's given me a new heart and put a new spirit inside of me. My confession is I just embrace embrace the will of God. I embrace the word of God. I embrace what's true of me that he says about me, and I confess it over my life. It doesn't make it so, but it brings me into agreement with it, and then the power of it's actually released in my world. So we don't get saved because of our ability to recite and confess all of our sins. We get saved because we agree with Jesus. Basically, we're saved because Jesus saved us. 
we're forgiven because he forgives us. What we do is we recognize that and say, thank you very much. So here is another thing in the, in the spirit of not. Another thing I'd like to clarify, something that I'm not saying. I'm also not saying that everybody will be saved. I, I, I have great expectations and great belief that, that as many as can be. But God says, you know, he's not willing that any should perish. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't know. It's, it's bad news. I think some people will successfully reject Jesus, and I think some people successfully have. But I want to explain that to you because, you know, God didn't send his son to condemn the world but to save the whole world. But here's the truth of it. He who believes in him is not condemned. Fantastic. Thank you, Jesus. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Now, why? Because he's not believed. The condemnation is that he hasn't believed. See, God condemns nobody. The sins of the whole world are gone. This verse is not saying that God, in a vindicative emotional outburst of anger at being rejected, has now decided to condemn you on the basis of your rejection rather than your law-breaking. That would be still God condemning you. It would just be changing the terms. God doesn't condemn anyone. Here is the condemnation. Thank God for the Bible. It's all spelled out in the Bible. When you do a verse by verse, line by line reading of the Bible, here it is, ready? Here is the condemnation. It's not coming from God. This is the condemnation. This is the judgment. This is the verdict right here. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So here's the condemnation. The ultimate reason is because people, people don't want the light. They don't, they don't embrace the light. That word loved, it's agape, and it's basically rooted in the idea of unconditional choice. And that word for hate, that's actually an unfortunate word. The Greek word is mazeo. And it's like a, it's a comparative word. It's the same word Jesus used when he said, unless you hate your father and mother and brother and sister and, and follow me, uh, you're not worthy of me. Well, he doesn't want you to hate your father and mother and brother and sister. It's actually, a, 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 I think, a poor translation. It's actually a comparative word that says, detest in comparison to another. So people chose over the light, the darkness. And they did that because they didn't want their deeds to be exposed. Now here's the thing, why don't people want to be exposed? I think it's the same reason Adam and Eve didn't want to be exposed. I think that, you know, human nature hasn't changed that much in the last like, couple thousand years, you know? I, th I think what, what Adam and Eve did is what people do today. It's either shame, it's fear, or it's dirty, nasty pride. People are afraid if they let go of darkness and come to the light that they're going to be judged. People are afraid. They've got a picture of God that says, God is just waiting to hammer you for your sins. And if that's the case, why would I come to the light? I mean, why would I come to a God who's got nothing but anger and judgment for me if I step into the light and let him see me for who I really am? I kind of don't blame people if that's their picture of Jesus. I don't blame them for not really wanting to come to him because I'm afraid that there's an expectation of judgment and punishment and I told you so, you're a bad kid. I, like, I just, I don't, I don't get that. I think people are afraid because they've got a bad picture of who God is. They have a fear-based lens and they've been taught and led to believe that he hates them, he's mad at them, he wants to kill them. So no wonder people aren't saying, here I am, Jesus. It's because they've got a bad picture. And I think still, there's some still who I think it's unfortunate, but they love their own works. They don't want to come into the light to be in a position where the inadequacy of their own self-righteousness is shown up as insufficient. I think some people, unfortunately, are just content to say, you know what, I'm going to do it on my own. If I come into the light, I'm going to be exposed as a fraud, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to come into the light and have to rely on the life and the, the grace of God. I'd prefer to do this thing by myself. And if people do that, they get the right, they have the right. God's given them the freedom to continue to hide in self-righteous delusion. But here's the thing, in both cases, whether it's fear and shame or whether it's pride, God is not the one condemning anyone. The people stay in a darkness of their own choosing. People forever experience the darkness of, that own, of their own choice. But the ones that come to the light, get this, they're not the self-righteous ones who come and claim to be saved by their own deeds that are done in the light. These are the ones who simply come and are able to confess, hey, we're in the light. Watch this, John chapter 3, verse 21. He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. This is, this is not saying, hey, guess what? There's some people out there running around doing light deeds, and they're now saved by their light deeds. These people are just coming and saying, hey, in recognition of the fact that the light is on and the light has come, here I am. 
They're saying, here I am, everything I am, all that I have, everything that I've done, I've done in the light. God, I'm not hiding from you at all. I say yes to your light shining on my life. I say yes to you. And these people aren't hiding from Jesus. They're embracing him and accepting him. They're not saved because they're doing light deeds, but by their recognition of their existence and acceptance in the light. They're saying, hey, look, everything I've done, I've done in the light. Some of it's been good, some of it's bad, but I'm doing it in Christ, and Christ is here, and Christ covers me. Christ is my all in all, and his blood is sufficient for every aspect of my life. Good deeds, bad deeds, any type of deeds, I've done them in the light, and I am saved, forgiven, and healed. That's the light of the revelation that I have of God in the person of Jesus. These people are just recognizing, hey, the light's on, and I embrace it. I, I think about this often. I think about, I mean, it's an interesting analogy, but if you consider this, you, you know, you could be in a room full of darkness. The, the room is dark. There's, there's nothing you can see. The room's full of awful obstacle, ob, obstacles on the floor, sharp and pointy things, things that'll hurt you. And uh, you can't see anything. I mean, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And you got your eyes closed. You just can't, you know, you, there, there's no way to see anything. The light switch is on the outside of the room. And your job, you got to get from one side of this room to the other. Okay, so you're, you're in a bad way. You're, you're going to take a step forward. You're going to step on something that hurts you. You can't see anything. You're stuck in this room. Now, somebody could come along and turn the lights on. And if you're inside that room, the light is on. The light is shining. Good things are happening. The light of God is coming. Like it says in the Bible, he causes his light to shine on the just and the unjust and his rain to fall. But you know what? You could be in that room and keep your eyes closed. And if you stay in that room with your eyes closed, it doesn't mean that the light's not shining. It just means that you've decided not to open your eyes, not to enjoy and partake of the benefits. You've decided not to participate in light. And your experience is still going to be filled full of darkness. You're still going to wander around that room bumping into things. Not because the light isn't shining, but because you've decided, no, no thanks, I'm going to try and find that light switch by myself. Or no, I just don't believe that. That sounds too good to be true. Honestly, somebody would come and turn the lights on? That's crazy. See, the issue in this, in this story is that the light is shining. It's shining on those with their eyes open, and it's shining on those with their eyes closed. The problem is whether you're going to open your eyes and believe and receive and accept it or not. But I'm telling you, the light of Christ is shining. What God's done, he's done for everybody. The forgiveness of sins, like the light shining in the room, it's there and it's available for everybody to enjoy. But some of us will experience this and some of us won't. But the issue is, will I just open my eyes? Not will I convince him to turn the light switch on. Not will I try to find a way to flick the switch. No, that's already been done. Jesus did that. He did for us what no one else could do. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So the question is now, do I accept it? Do I embrace it? Do I believe enough to open my eyes? Do I dare to trust him? Because what he's done, he's done, and he doesn't need to do anything else. Now, I think that this is all super, super, super important stuff. Because when we realize that what Jesus did, he did for everybody, it actually changes the way we see the world. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had this kind of uh, evangelism kind of experience where you've got people in your world who you really want to see become Christians. And uh, I mean, the, the whole experience can be fraught with anxiety and pressure and stress. Like, oh my goodness, are they going to accept me? Are they going to reject me? Uh, how can I present this in a way that's going to persuade them? How can I do this in a way that's going to get them to make a commitment or a decision? It's like you're like a, a used car person trying to, to make a, not that there's anything wrong with that, if that's your thing. But it's like you're trying to make, a, make something happen, like you're trying to close a deal. But I'll tell you what, sharing the gospel is not trying to close a deal. Sharing the gospel is announcing good news. And when you announce the good news, like the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, faith comes. Faith comes and then it's up to them. It's like somebody running into that dark room and saying, the lights are on, the lights are on, the lights are on. You were not telling people turn the switch on. The lights are already on. Just embrace the fact that it's there. This will change. This will transform how you share the gospel with people. But also, I'm hoping you're going to see that you can proclaim the gospel with incredible power and expectation that when you speak the name of Jesus, when you share the goodness of God, something powerful and something mighty happens no matter what. When you proclaim Jesus, when you declare the good news, when you make the good news an announcement rather than an invitation, I'll tell you what, things are going to start to happen. Things are going to move. And it's super, super important that we let the, the, the good news of the gospel, that God is not holding the sins of the world against them, that we let that filter into every aspect of our lives. And here, here's one thing I want to share. We're going to, we're going to close with this, but we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and work our way down. And I think this is really, really important, starting at, sorry, starting at verse 16. Paul said this. He said, in light of all this, basically, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. How amazing is that? We regard no one according to the flesh. Uh, 
When you think about that, when you think about what that actually means, that has some incredible implications. That means from now on, I'm not supposed to see anybody who they are in the flesh, who they are in Adam, who they are in their fallen humanity, but I'm meant to see everybody according to what Christ has done. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine seeing your neighbors, not as or the, the people on TV or the people in the world who you think are responsible for the moral decay in the world? Can you imagine not seeing those as enemies, but seeing those as people for whom Jesus died? If you could see those as people for whom Jesus has already purchased their forgiveness, uh, people for whom God is not holding their sins against them, all of a sudden the world's a less adversarial place. And the gospel starts to take on something that sounds like the gospel of peace. Which even Ephesians chapter 6, when they're talking about spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul says, hey, here's how you got to deal with spiritual warfare. Put the armor of God on, and the piece of equipment on your feet is the gospel of the readiness to share the gospel of peace. The gospel is shared in peace. The good news is peace. The good news can't, doesn't work. It's not meant to be shared in an adversarial kind of way where we're looking at insiders and outsiders and blaming people. But I'm telling you, if you can see everybody with, you know, in, in the light of who Jesus is and what he's done for them, you're going to have a totally different experience in life and a totally different experience of sharing the word. And when you see that Jesus took on all of humanity, not just a select few, but he took on all of humanity, and in him we live and move and have our being, when you see that and you can apply that to everybody, because remember, Paul said that, in him we live, move, and have our being. And he said that to a, Greek, a group of Greek philosophers that he was trying to make disciples. These guys weren't even saved yet, but he's saying, in him we live, we move, and have our being. And the unknown God that you worship is actually Jesus. It's in him that we have our being. And he says to, to them, and when you can start to see the world, when you can start to see the people in it through that lens, this is what happens to you. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, the love of Christ will start to compel us. We'll start to be controlled by the love of Christ. Our interactions with people will be compelled by love because we judge this. You'll see the world this way, that if one died for all, that all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I think that's absolutely amazing. If one died for all, all died. The question is not whether you're alive. The question is whether you're alive in the life of Christ and living for him. The Bible talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. There's something universal of what Jesus did for all of humanity, but it's tapped into, it's realized, and it's made real in your life when you open your eyes in faith. But what he did, he did for everybody. And the love of Christ compels us because we see this as applicable to everybody, not just a core group of insiders. But we look at the world and say, yes, this is for you too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I skipped over this one, but it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. That's absolutely incredible. When you consider looking at people through the lens of what Jesus has done, I'll tell you what, newness happened at the cross. Newness happened at the resurrection. Newness happened when Jesus stepped out of the tomb, when he stepped out of what the Psalms call the womb of the morning, when he stepped out of the, the womb of the earth, a new birth happened, a new humanity emerged with him. And the choice is, am I going to participate in this by faith or not? But newness of life has happened there. That's why there's such incredible hope in the gospel. That's why the creation itself is waiting it's groaning, waiting for the revealing of the sons and the daughters of God because Jesus already did what needed to be done for the transformation of the whole cosmos. He reconciled the whole cosmos to himself. Now the world's waiting for an awakened group of people to say, yes, I accept that, I embrace it, and I'm going to walk in the fullness of it. And the love of Christ can, can compel us as we do this. And the Bible says that now all things are of God who has reconciled us, past tense to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us this ministry of reconciliation. This ministry is chiefly to tell other people that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. We got to get over the idea that says sin is the issue. Sin is not the issue. It's the Son of God that's the issue. The Son is the issue. And therefore, because of this, he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's given us a word to, to go and share and tell people and declare this good news to everybody. And then as his ambassadors, it says, for Christ, as though we, he were pleading through us, we implore people, be reconciled to God. 
We implore people, be reconciled to God in light of the fact that he's reconciled you to himself. He's done it all. And you know what? For you and for me, part of our discipleship, part of, part of our walking with Jesus is becoming skilled in dividing the word, becoming bold in the announcements of the good news, and telling people they are reconciled to God because God is already reconciled. Accept it. Believe it. This is true. This is absolutely 100% true. And we can do all this and be confident of all of this because of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you're afraid that we're not making a big enough deal about sin, I'd encourage you to look at this verse. God made an incredible big deal about sin. He actually became a man, took on a human body so he could enter into the full depth of the suffering that sin brings. It is an evil, ugly thing, and it kills. But I'll tell you what, Jesus took it all. He embraced it. Sin is not the issue. The sin of the world is not the problem. All of humanity stands before God not guilty. The verdict has gone out. You are accepted. You are loved. You are forgiven. And you are made new. The question is, will you accept it? Will you dare to open your eyes? Will you dare to believe it? Will you say yes as faith arises in your heart, as you hear the good news and something positive starts to bubble up inside of you and you say, yeah, wow, that's me. Will you embrace it and will you just say, yes, Lord, let it be unto me according to your word. Yes, that's true for me. I'll tell you what, if you can do that, it's like standing in a room, opening your eyes and discovering that the, light, the room was already full of light. It was already there. I love the way the Message Bible puts it here in Romans chapter 5. It says, by entering into faith, by entering through faith into what God always wanted to do for us, to set us right with him, to make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master, Jesus. And that's not all. By entering in through faith into what God always wanted to do for us, we throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. Wow, I mean, we think we're coming to Jesus, but I'll tell you what, Jesus has already come to you. We think we're running to him, but I'll tell you, he's already there. He's already grabbed us. He's already, he's already embraced us. He's already taken us up in himself. When Jesus became a human being, he took up the whole of the human race in himself. And I'm telling you, what's left for you is to say yes and amen. We got to see it. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. So I hope that's brought some clarity to you. Maybe it's brought more questions. I don't know. But hey, come to small group this week. We're going to talk it through. It's going to be great. But uh, bring, your, bring your Bibles. Bring your Bible study. Circle, underline. Come on. We're going to get into the Bible this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, but I hope this has brought some clarity to you. Because you know what? When we look, at the, look out over the landscape of the world, it's right now a very polarized and tribal place where people are like, oh my goodness, not this, not that. Oh my goodness, what is going on? What is happening? And I'll tell you what. If we can minister to people out in the world, if we can minister to people uh, without animosity or uh, adversarial tone, in our hearts. If we can say, you know what, this isn't something that I'm trying to necessarily force on you. It's something I want to share with you. I'll tell you what, there's a generation of people out there who are totally accept, like accepting and open to that kind of communication. And I believe that's going to be absolutely key to seeing the harvest. Letting the force and the power of the gospel speak for itself. You are forgiven. You are, you are healed by his stripes. You are forgiven. There is wholeness and, and healing and life in Christ. Just accept it. That's all you got to do. So yeah, like I said, I hope this has brought some clarity to you, and uh, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful to live in the times that I do. I'm so grateful. I'm so expectant about what God's doing, and uh, I, I'm really grateful, and I'm personally, I'm just kind of zeroing in again, just, just digging down and digging deep into the gospel and enjoying the fact that God has actually called us to be partners with him in this ministry of reconciliation. So that's what I pray for you today, honestly. I pray that you will realize and just deeply connect with the fact that you have an active part to play in, in God's purpose right now, in sharing and announcing his good news, and it really is good news. And now if you know what, if there's somebody out there today, you've, you've kind of been watching, you're listening, maybe you're watching right now, maybe you're watching later, I don't know, but you've heard something today and you, you've, you've had some faith rise up in your heart. You've said, yeah, that's true of me. And you've been able to say that for the first time. For the first time, you've realized God loves you and he's, part, he's, he's joined himself to you. I want you to do something for us. I want you to go to impactlondon.ca. I want you to fill out our Connect card and just let us know that that's something that's happened with you. Because we'd love to help you. We'd, help, we'd love to help explain. We'd love to help... Uh, 
walk with you and kind of disciple, just kind of unpack for you what that means and how it is. What is the mechanism by which you have been saved and how can you move on in this life now? We'd like to share that with you. And uh, you know what, everybody else, if you if you got prayer needs today, there's something that you need ministry for, you can go to impactlondon.ca and we've got an a, a online lobby. Just look for the All Access Pass. There's going to be trained prayer uh, team members who can pray for you. We can go into a, a confidential private room and uh, receive prayer. So that's all online. That's at impactlondon.ca. And just scroll down, look for the All Access Pass button. And uh, our online host, Jeremy, he'll be there waiting for you. And you'll be able to jump in. But so you know I'm going to pray for you real quick. And then we're going to go. But Father, I thank you so much. Thank you for sending your son into this world, not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. I thank you, Father, that the blood of Jesus is sufficient for the sins of the whole world. I thank you, Lord, that you so love this world. This world is not big and bad and ugly to you. You loved it. You decided it was worth dying for. And I just thank you. And I pray, God, that each one of us just really resonates and deeply connects with the gospel and the power of it, the power to share that gospel, the power to share that message with our friends, with our neighbors, with the people we might be in lockdown with right now. I don't know. But I just pray that the full power and the full force of your gospel and your good news, the power of God unto salvation would just flow out of us. And I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in groups.